Welcome everyone to today's webinar titled <clears throat> RFI mapped well, RFI mapped by spaceborne GNSSR data based on a paper published in the winter 2023 issue of Navigation, the Journal of the Institute of Navigation. This paper can be accessed from the Navigation Open Access website at navi, that's N-A-V-I dot I-O-N dot org, where you can read, download, cite, and share this article and many others. Today's webinar is presented by Dr. Clara Chu. Dr. Chu is a senior scientist at Muon Space and is a soil hydrologist who specializes in using surface reflected GNSS signals for remote sensing of soil moisture and surface water mapping. She got her PhD from the University of Colorado at Boulder in 2015 and was a NASA postdoctoral program fellow at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory from 2015 to 2017. <clears throat> Since then, she has worked as a soft money research scientist and is now at Muon Space, a private satellite startup that is working to advance the state of the art in GNSS reflections research. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website at ion.org and on our YouTube channel and social media channels in the coming days. Following the presentation, we'll accept questions from the audience. You can submit your questions at any time uh, by text using the Q&A button in your viewer. Now, thank you for joining us. We'll turn the time over to Dr. Chu. All right, thank you so much. Um, again, my name is Clara and my co-authors co and I work at a private satellite startup called Muon Space. But even though we're all co-workers right now, we actually began this project before any of us worked at Muon. And it's just kind of a happy coincidence that we all ended up working at the same spot. So today I'll be walking you through some analysis that we've done in mapping radio frequency interference using space-borne GNSS reflectometry data. So when I say RFI, I'm referring to RFI in the GNSS bands which means signals emitted either intentionally or unintentionally that interfere with uh, GNSS signals and make them either more difficult or even impossible to use for their intended purpose, which as we all know is positioning and navigation. And if you've never heard of GNSS reflectometry before, it's totally fine, don't worry, because part of this talk will be introducing you to the fine world of GNSSR. So I'd like to begin by telling the story about how I started mapping GNSS RFI because I'm gonna be honest with you guys, RFI is actually not my area of expertise <laughs> at all. Uh, it has become somewhat of a hobby of mine, but I'm quite confident that a lot of you listening here today have more experience with analyzing RFI from a physics or a signal processing point of view and I don't think I have anything new to tell you in that uh, respect that might enlighten you. But I do think some of the things that we've noticed are cool to show and might spur ideas from you all uh, about new research directions to go with this. So this talk will really be two chapters. Uh, the first one will be about my research, which is pretty unrelated to RFI and how I stumbled into looking at this kind of data. And then the second chapter, we'll be talking about the details of mapping RFI with our data and showing some neat examples of interesting things that we've seen. So as we already said, uh, my background is in soil hydrology and my work involves thinking way too much about how water moves around in the top few centimeters of soil. And I use a variety of sensors to understand shallow surface hydrology. Here's a picture of me and a collaborator doing a GPR uh, transect on the north slope of Alaska this past summer. So what the heck is someone like me doing R uh, doing mapping RFI? Uh, so the majority of my research involves understanding how a relatively new remote sensing technique called GNSS reflectometry or GNSSR can help us observe the terrestrial hydrologic cycle. And I just wanna make a note that although I'm using the umbrella term GNSS here, Really, the only signals I'm going to be talking about today are GPS signals, and you might hear me accidentally use those terms interchangeably. Anyway, as I'm sure you are all aware, GPS satellites are continuously transmitting L-band signals towards the Earth for positioning and navigation purposes. But what not everybody realizes is that these signals bounce off of the ground and they go all the way back out to space. And depending on the properties of the reflecting surface, this reflected signal will change. So if you have a modified GPS receiver on a satellite, 
and a GPS antenna that's looking down towards the Earth's surface, you can record these surface reflected signals and watch how they change in both space and time. And those changes in the surface reflected signal are associated with a lot of interesting stuff, including things like ocean surface roughness, which can be used to retrieve ocean surface wind speed. Uh, you can estimate near surface soil moisture, map an inundation extent. Uh, we've seen sensitivity to sea ice and a bunch of other stuff um, that I haven't listed. And the GNSSR mission that most of us in the field use is called CYGNUS, which stands for Cyclone GNSS. It was the first Earth. Uh, it was the first NASA Earth Venture class mission, and it was launched in December of 2016. It's a constellation of eight GNSSR satellites that orbit the tropics, and it was designed to retrieve ocean surface wind speed during hurricanes. Now, the orbit of Cygnus prevents data collection outside about plus or minus 40 degrees latitude. Cygnus records L1 GPS signals, and each of these eight satellites carries two downward-looking GPS antennas, and these antennas are slightly tilted from horizontal. I think it's around 20 to 30 degrees or so, and I'm trying to illustrate that in the bottom left-hand cartoon. Okay. Now, this movie shows an illustration of the eight Cygnus satellites and how their surface sampling looks like over a period of 24 hours, and I'll explain all of these colors in just a minute. Um, fundamentally, Cygnus is what's called a signals of opportunity mission, okay, and that we collect signals that are transmitted for an entirely different purpose, and we use them for remote sensing, which is a much more economical way of remote sensing than building and launching your own transmitters to do the same thing. So GNSSR satellites record something called delay Doppler maps, or DDMs, and these are two-dimensional cross-correlations between the received signal, so the surface reflected signal, and then a locally generated replica of what we think the signal, a direct signal, should look like. Uh, and I'm showing an example of a DDM on the right-hand side of the slide. And that bluish, whitish, kind of horseshoe-looking thing is our surface reflection. And in my job, I take the peak value of the delay Doppler map, and then I turn it into a reflectivity value, which is what I was coloring those dots by on the, in the movie on the previous slide. And except for special data collections, the satellite only sends down a cropped version of this full delay Doppler map. And I've indicated that by the white dashed box. So we really don't have access to the full information contained in the other parts of the DDM, but we do have a few summary statistics, and this will become important later for mapping RFI. So if you look at the red horizontal line that I've drawn on the DDM, everything above that line is sometimes called the forbidden zone. And in the forbidden zone, it should really only contain noise. Okay, so the y-axis of the DDM is in terms of delay or time. And in theory, for an ocean surface, anything occurring above that red line arrives at the GNSSR receiver too soon to be a surface reflection because we know where the Cygnus satellites are relative to the ocean surface. And I tried to illustrate that in the cartoon on the left. So the forbidden zone is often used to calculate noise statistics for quality control purposes. And even though the satellite doesn't send down every pixel of the forbidden zone, it does send down the value of the kurtosis. Okay, so kurtosis is a measure of the tailedness of the distribution of values in the forbidden zone. And then it also sends down the mean noise value. And I'm showing those two values for this particular DDM um, on the DDM. So for this DDM, the kurtosis is 2.6 and the mean noise value was about 42. So anyway, my day job involves mapping how reflectivity changes over the land surface. And then I relate those changes to changes in surface hydrology. And here's just one example of how the data respond to a major flood event in this case, in northeastern Australia. On the left, you're seeing uh, Cygnus reflectivity observations. And then on the right uh, were false color images during a major storm. And you can see in the false color images that after the storm is gone, um, we're left with these major flooded areas, which correspond really well to increased reflectivity in the same spot. And this just shows a zoomed in view of the flooded area and how it compares to other passive and active microwave instruments. And so there are a lot of research groups that are working on algorithms to turn these reflectivity observations into maps of surface inundation. 
And then my personal favorite application of GNSSR data is using it to retrieve near surface soil moisture. A few years ago, I developed an algorithm to turn our observations of reflectivity into soil moisture retrievals. And I'm showing one example here, which is a time series of soil moisture retrievals from a location in Texas where we have an in situ soil moisture probe, which I'm showing by the blue line. So whenever it rains, soil moisture increases, and then it takes a few days for the soil moisture uh, to dry down. And my soil moisture retrievals using Cygnus data are shown by the pink dots. And even if you don't know much about soil moisture or you don't care, um, you can see that the pink dots track the blue line pretty well. So this is one indication that our retrievals are doing a good job at estimating soil moisture. And then we also compare our soil moisture retrievals with the state of the art soil moisture retrievals from a NASA satellite called SMAP. And I've indicated those by the green dots. And so our retrievals, at least at this location, performed really similarly to SMAP. And the linchpin of this retrieval algorithm is that we've observed a positive correlation between our reflectivity observations and other sources of soil moisture data. So here's a random example from a location, I think this is in Turkmenistan. Um, so on the top, I'm showing a time series of reflectivity observations. And then on the bottom, I'm showing a time series of soil moisture retrievals from the SMAP satellite. And it's pretty clear and easy to see that reflectivity goes up when soil moisture goes up. And as the soil dries out, reflectivity decreases. And here's another example, in this case from West Africa, where again, we see the positive correlation between reflectivity and soil moisture. And this relationship is pretty consistent, no matter where you are on the Earth's surface. Or at least I thought so. Because then I saw this. Uh, so this is a time series of reflectivity from a location in Libya. And if you look at the data in 2017 and 2018, you're like, well, reflectivity goes up when soil moisture goes up, that's expected. But then something happened in mid 2019 that made our reflectivity observations just go haywire. And when I saw this, this kind of freaked me out because I developed my retrieval algorithm using data all the way back in 2018. Um, and so, when this anomaly happened in mid-2019, I actually didn't notice it for a pretty long time because I had other stuff to do. So when I finally noticed it, I was like, what did I do? Like, what, what mistake did I make? And I probably spent a week parsing through my data, just wondering, like, was I gridding the data wrong? Was I calibrating it wrong? Like, how did I mess this up? So I started looking at my reflectivity observations, not just in Libya, but in other places. And although this problem seemed to be regional in North Africa, it wasn't global. So I thought, okay, it's probably not a bug in my code. And this is when my co-author, Max, suggested that it might be RFI, because he worked a lot with radio occultation data from the Cosmic 2 satellites, and he was seeing weird things in his data in the same region too. And everybody already knew that RFI could potentially affect the data that Cygnus collects. I mean, we use GPS antennas that just stare down at the earth. So of course they could be susceptible to RFI. Cygnus even has an RFI flag to indicate when the data are being affected by it. So on the left, I'm showing the same DDM that I did earlier, along with their kurtosis and mean noise value of the forbidden zone. And then on the right, I'm showing a DDM that is corrupted by RFI. So RFI looks like these stripes in the DDM, and it's usually present across all values of delay, but only present in a few Doppler bins. And the way that Cygnus designed the RFI flag was to threshold the value of kurtosis of the forbidden zone, such that any DDM with a noise kurtosis value greater than four would be flagged as RFI. And if you look at the kurtosis value of this DDM, it is greater than four and therefore would be flagged as RFI. But there's a problem. The RFI flag doesn't work well over land. And this isn't the fault of the Cygnus engineers. Okay, Cygnus was designed to be an ocean mission, not a land mission. And there are two things about the land surface that do complicate the interpretation of the kurtosis value. The first is that when the land surface uh, exceeds about 600 meters in surface elevation, 
the surface reflection actually occurs in this forbidden zone. Because remember that the forbidden zone was defined as when a surface reflection coming from the mean sea surface was no longer theoretically possible. But a large part of the land surface is a lot higher than the ocean surface, which decreases the amount of time it takes for the, for the reflection to travel from the surface to the satellite. So the reflection comes in before the Cygnus satellite thinks it should. So in the example on the left, I'm showing a surface reflection in the forbidden zone from a higher altitude region. And note that its kurtosis value is above eight, which would trigger the RFI flag. And the second thing about the land surface that messes with the RFI flag are reflections coming from inland surface water. These reflections tend to be incredibly coherent, so much so that the side lobes of the GPS autocorrelation function can be seen in the forbidden zone of the DDM, and I'm indicating those by the green circles here. This also affects the kurtosis value, which in this case for this DDM is above seven. And just to drive the point home, in the top left slide uh, side of the slide is a map of reflectivity observations over the Amazon basin in South America. You can easily see all the rivers and streams producing really high reflectivity values. And then on the bottom right hand side of the slide, I'm showing the percentage of time the RFI flag is set to on for each little location in the Amazon basin. So most of the time over these inland surface waters, those little side lobes of the DDM are falsely triggering the RFI flag. And then here's an example of how surface elevation affects the RFI flag. So the panel on the top shows the mean kurtosis value for any particular location. And the pink contour line indicates areas where the surface elevation exceeds 600 meters. So you can see that once your surface elevation is higher than 600, your kurtosis is high enough to almost always trigger the RFI flag. And I hope that most people who work with Cygnus data are aware of this, but I have a feeling that some people are still using the standard RFI flag, and that's gonna severely restrict the amount of data they have to work with. Okay, so let's recap. So far, I've told you that Cygnus reflectivity data can be used to map inland surface water and soil moisture. And that I noticed that my reflectivity data over North Africa started to get real weird in the summer of 2019. One of my colleagues suggested that this might be RFI, but the standard RFI flag in the Cygnus data can't be trusted over the land surface. And this brings me to the second chapter of my talk, which is how to actually map RFI using Cygnus data over land, and then to discuss some notable examples. All right. So in order for me to figure out if it really was RFI that was messing with my reflectivity observations, I needed a different way to indicate when there was RFI in my DDMs because kurtosis wasn't cutting it. Okay, so remember how I said that there were two summary statistics brought down that described the data in the forbidden zone, kurtosis and the mean value? So a while ago, I had read a paper that broadly associated the mean value of the forbidden zone with RFI from SBAS satellites, which are shown by the white uh, squares, diamonds near the equator in the figure down here on the left. And this was done using data from a GNSSR satellite that was launched before Cygnus, and it was polar orbiting, so you got data everywhere. And I believe that these data might be from 2015 or 2016, so several years before my reflectivity data started going haywire. But the authors noted that where the SBS satellites are, the mean noise value is higher, which is seen by these red blobs of data over the ocean. And in the paper, the team had noted that there was another red blob of high noise data between the Black and Caspian Seas, and they had hypothesized that this was also due to RFI, but they didn't really, uh, they didn't have time to really dig into it further. So from this, I decided to look at our mean noise value and see if there was anything interesting in the Cygnus data that might help explain the weird stuff that I was seeing. And to start with, I plotted the mean noise value from just one of Cygnus's two antennas and just from times when the satellite was ascending in its orbit. And I plotted the mean noise value using all of my data from the year 2018. And one thing that I had to do in order to successfully make these maps is kind of shift my thinking because I'm used to plotting data, whether it's reflectivity observations or the mean noise value, 
Um, I'm used to plotting the data in terms of its specular reflection location on the surface, but what I actually had to do was plot the data in terms of where the antenna beam was directed at the ground, which is a function of the spacecraft position and then the tilt of the antennas. So for those of you in the audience who use Cygnus data and might want to map RFI with it, I would suggest that you also plot the data in some variation of this way. So this cartoon here, little circle with the triangles. Um, it illustrates the antenna that I'm looking at. So here I'm looking at data from the port antenna uh, using P for port. Um, and here the port antenna, it's always looking kind of to the north. And for the ascending tracks, the satellite is moving basically northeast. And so for the most part, this is the orientation of the antenna and its beam is directed perpendicularly or ish to the direction of satellite movement. So the antenna, is looking northwest. And immediately you see this blob of high noise in the Middle East and the highest values are over Syria. But this noise blob, it has a tail that kind of extends all the way over Saudi Arabia and it's pointing at the direction of the antenna. And this tail is interesting because if you were to plot the descending satellite tracks, the tail shifts. Though the maximum of the blob doesn't move very much. So these are just things that I was observing about the data. And one notable thing that I also observed is that the mean noise value seems to be much less sensitive to high elevation reflections being in the forbidden zone. And it's also not as sensitive to surface water. So I was starting to feel like maybe the mean noise value could be a better indicator of RFI than the kurtosis value. But what was this red blob? Because the noise data recorded by the starboard antenna doesn't see those blobs, hardly at all. You see like a little hint of them up here, but it's fairly quiet on the starboard side, okay? And this is because if the source of the noise is located to the north of the Cygnus satellite and the starboard antenna is always looking south, it's not going to be as affected by that source of noise like the port antenna would be. And the fact that we have two antennas looking in different directions and changing their orientations, depending on whether the satellite is ascending or descending is kind of cool because in a way it gives us several different views of the source of the noise. And it turns out that if you average all of these views together from the port and starboard antennas, we get a better idea of where the noise is coming from than if we only have one antenna looking in one direction. And I tried this on our noise data from 2018. Okay, so this is the average of all the noise data regardless of the antenna. And now you can see that our blob of noise is much more constrained to a smaller area. And so my hypothesis was that very generally, less noise means less RFI and more noise means more RFI. But I hadn't really proven that yet. So to prove it, I looked at this paper uh, down in the bottom left, which mapped GNSS RFI from an instrument on the International Space Station. And this team was able to pinpoint the exact location of an RFI emitter located on a Russian airbase in Syria. And this black dot here is showing the location of that RFI emitter. Okay, and this black dot, it, smith, it sits right smack dab in the middle of our high noise hotspot. So I got really excited when I saw this because now I was confident that my map of mean noise was doing a really good job at indicating where RFI on the surface is coming from. Now, obviously you can tell from the zoomed in map that it would be difficult to pinpoint the exact location of where the RFI is coming from using our data. It's more of like a quick regional approximation. And for the other examples that I'm going to show later, I'll also be approximating the location of the source with other little black dots, some of which I'm showing in this uh, map up here. But these are by no means exact locations. They're just approximations of where the center of the noise blobs tend to sit. Okay, so I was confident the high noise hotspot over Syria was due to a known previously mapped source of RFI. But what about the example that I showed earlier? The source of RFI in Syria had been emitting for all of 2018, but my data in 2018 looked just fine and they didn't start to get wonky until mid 2019. So what was happening there? Okay, so to figure this out, I did the same thing as I did here with data in 2018, 
but now I shifted my time period and looked at data from the second half of 2019. So from the first six months of when my reflectivity observations started to be strange. And now this is what I saw. Okay, so a new hotspot had emerged over Libya and this noise was high enough to rival that observed in Syria. Okay, so I'll just flip back and forth a little bit. So this is 2018, 2019, okay? And in addition to this really high noise hotspot, um, I saw other less powerful hotspots, but still noticeable over Venezuela and over Yemen. Um, so again, I'll flip back and forth again. And you can see that the noise changed between those two time periods. So now I was like, this is really interesting because I looked as hard as I could and I couldn't find other people who had also mapped RFI associated with these hotspots. But the timing of their appearance and their disappearance was closely tied to the start of regional conflicts or to an increase in fighting in pre-existing regional conflicts. And so a lot of the paper that we published in ION was us saying, hey, it kind of looks like there's RFI here, Let's see if these hotspots are associated with news reports of anything significant going on in the area. In Venezuela, for example, this hotspot appeared right on January 20th, 2019, right over Caracas. Uh, this was 10 days before the start of nationwide protests um, about their leader at the time. I don't know if he's still their leader, uh, Nicola Maduro. And January 20th was also one day before a failed military coup. This hotspot persisted for the rest of 2019 and since then has kind of become more intermittent. And we don't know for sure that someone turned on a GPS jammer or spoofer the day before a military coup because they were associated with the coup somehow. It could just be a coincidence. And everything I'm going to say in this talk from now on are mostly just correlation, temporal correlations, okay? But they're interesting. Okay, and this hotspot in Libya was particularly intriguing. Um, so again, as I said before, it first appears in June of 2019, and this black dot is the city of Combs. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. And we saw several reports of GPS outages by ships in the region that kind of helped confirm our suspicion that this is probably indeed RFI. Um, and the appearance of this hotspot in June of 2019 did coincide with an increase in fighting near the capital of Tripoli during the civil war that I think is still going on. And even more interesting, this hotspot did not stay in the same location. So in the second half of June 2020, the hotspot disappeared, okay? But it reappeared a few days later, but was now located more in the city of Sirte to the east, so I'll flip back and forth. So this is second half of 2019, second half of 2020. So that hotspot has clearly changed location. Um, and in June of 2020, this was the exact time when fighting in the Civil War shifted to the town of Sirte. And again, these events appear to be correlated in their timing and location, but I don't know for sure, okay? so. It's possible uh, we were looking at, we, I mean, we we're just Googling around and we saw that um, there was a Turkish electronic warfare system that was apparently really high power and reported to be in use. But there are also news reports of this equipment perhaps being destroyed in July of 2020. And this doesn't agree with our observations because we've seen the RFI in Libya to persist until the end of 2022. So we still don't really know the exact source of this um, RFI. Okay, so this just shows data from the end of 2022. Um, the hotspot in Libya did finally disappear after being, I mean, it was on all the time for the past three years. Um, but of course, more hotspots have since appeared. Uh, notably, there's one in Kashmir that's sometimes there, sometimes not. Uh, there's a pretty relatively high power one in Myanmar. Uh, it's hard to tell from this figure, but there's also one that sometimes occurs in Somalia and then also in the Central African Republic. And <laughs> this is an ugly figure, but we manually looked at our noise maps and we wrote down when and where we saw these hotspots. And this is kind of a summary of locations of RFI hotspots and their durations. And you can see that some are always there and others come and go over time. 
Um, one thing that I'm sure some of you are wondering is all of my figures have so far just been in terms of noise. I didn't try to threshold the data to come up with a new RFI flag or anything like that. And that was on purpose. I really wanted this initial study to be a, hey, this is what we see. Sometimes RFI hotspots have really, really high noise and sometimes it's lower, but it's still noticeable in our data. Um, and then I guess the last thing I wanna say about this is that when we were researching why there might be RFI in these different areas, um, the Wagner group was mentioned as being active in many of the conflicts that I've noted here. Uh, I haven't seen reports that the Wagner group carries a GPS jammer or spoofer with them, and it could absolutely be a coincidence because, I mean, sometimes it seems like the Wagner group is involved in every conflict, um, but it is just another detail that we noticed. But again, can't definitively tie to anything. Uh, and then finally, uh, I wanted to show some recent changes in RFI that we've noticed over the Israeli-Palestinian region. So this is a map of noise in the months prior to the attack by Hamas on October 7th of this year. And here you see the usual high noise over the Middle East. Um, this could be due to the Syrian transmitter or perhaps a combination of that transmitter and reports of RFI in Ukraine, which is obviously too far north for the Cygnus satellites to see, but it could potentially be leaking down and affecting our data. Um, and then we also see this hotspot that we hadn't seen before in Sudan. Um, so this is before the attack by Hamas. And then this is after. So this is a map of mean noise from October 7th to October 25th. And there were several reports of Israel using GPS jammers to try to thwart additional missiles launched by Hamas coming into Israel. So I think this hotspot is likely associated with that. And this is a time series of our noise data over the Israeli-Palestinian region, which I'm showing by the red maroon dots. Uh, and then the blue dots, show the global mean noise just for context to make sure that any changes in noise that we see isn't due to some sort of systemic problem with the data. But as the last slide showed, right on October 8th or even beginning on October 7th, I mean, RFI really jumped. There's a clear step change in the data. Uh, and then we see that between October 26th and 27th, noise goes down a little bit. Uh, it's still higher than it was before October, but there is a clear decrease in the noise. And again, what I'm presenting are events that are temporally correlated, but it doesn't mean necessarily that these events cause the change in RFI. Uh, but I did find it interesting that October 27th was the start of the ground incursion by the Israeli military into Gaza. So this is what we've done, uh, but in terms of where we'd like to go, uh, we'd really like to create an online RFI viewer uh, indicating where and when we see these increases in noise that we associate with increases in RFI. The figure that I'm showing here is not our viewer, but it represents one that we think would be cool to emulate. Uh, this viewer maps reports of GNSS interference by aviators. Um, and if you, I think it's gpsjam.org, but it's pretty fun to click around. Um, and I've noticed that here in Kashmir, aviators are also reporting RFI in the same area where our noise data is indicating RFI. Um, one thing that I think that our type of data could add to this is that since this viewer relies on planes being able to fly over an area, it can sometimes be limited spatially. So particularly over areas like Ukraine, which is pretty obvious from this figure. And even though Cygnus itself isn't polar orbiting and can't see out of plus or minus 40 degrees latitude, there are other GNSSR satellites on orbit now or plan to be launched in the coming years that will be polar orbiting. And so I hope that we could use data from these additional GNSSR satellites to come up with global maps of RFI. So that's all I have for you today. Um, thank you for listening. Uh, I'm always looking for collaborators, so feel free to email me if you'd like to work on a project together. I also have a YouTube channel that's called The Weekly Chew. This is a vast exaggeration. It's more like the biannual chew, but occasionally I post videos about GNSSR and very often about GNSSR mapping RFI. So if you liked this talk or if you found it somewhat interesting, 
please go check out my channel. Um, otherwise, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Claire, thanks for this great presentation. Um, as uh, Dr. Chu said, we'll now accept audience questions, which you can submit uh, using the Q&A button in your viewer. And uh, just to get us started, we have a question here. Um, now, you showed with that original RFI that you, you came across in Northern Africa in 2019, um, that your data got interrupted. So will GNSSR data always be unusable in locations where uh, you're seeing RFI? Yeah, so I think um, that really depends on the strength of your surface reflection in that area. So as long as your surface reflected signal is a higher power than your RFI, then you can probably still use the data. So you know, if you had RFI over a calm inland water body, your reflectivity observations might still be high enough that doesn't really, uh, the RFI doesn't really affect it. But when you have, you know, an area like the Middle East, which is typically dry with lower uh, reflectivity values in general, then it's easier for the RFI to kind of overwhelm the reflected signal. Okay, interesting. A um, question here says, just out of curiosity, did you see any patterns um, of day versus night? Um, I did not look at that. That would definitely be something to, to look at. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, this was just an initial study, um, and I think there's all kinds of uh, more detailed data analysis that you could do with the data that what could potentially pick out day versus night differences, or even constrain those high noise blobs to be um, more representative of the location of where the RFI is coming from. Okay, great. Um, now you mentioned at the end, there's a question here about are there other satellites available to gather GNSSR data? Now you mentioned at the end there are, are there any that, that come to mind? Yeah, so there, um, there's a private company called Spire. Um, they've launched a couple polar orbiting CubeSats. Um, I have not looked at their data. Um, and then my company, Muon Space, is going to be launching a GNSSR satellite in February or March of this coming year. So we're going to have GNSSR data soon. And then also uh, ESA, the European Space Agency, they are going to launch two GNSSR satellites, I think, at the end of next year. So that'll be more data. And then um, I think China and maybe Taiwan have a satellite, have each have a satellite as well. Uh, but I, I don't think we're able to look at those data. Okay, great. Uh, a couple of related questions here. Uh, this says, is the mean noise the same as mean error? Um, or how do you calculate the mean noise? Um, so for those, the mean noise, let me just pull up a DDM, sorry. There we go. Um, so the mean noise here, you can see all the pixels of the forbidden zone. And so each one of these pixels has a different value, like 46, 47, 48, 50, whatever. And so the mean noise value is literally just the mean of those pixels. It's really um, nothing beyond that. Yeah. Okay, thanks. A uh, question here from Greg Weaver says in 2025, the SDA will have a near global return of terrestrial GNSS RFI from its uh, T1 transport constellation. Cool. It's a statement. Yeah. Related That's awesome. to. Uh, yeah. Uh, another question here is um, you mentioned Cygnus is focusing on the oceans, um, but it seems that um, I'm just trying to read this here. The, the RFI uh, is affecting the data. Um, is it affecting mostly land or is it affecting the ocean? I guess is the question here. Yeah, so that's a good question. So um, at least say for the for the RFI transmitter in Syria, a lot of the data over the Mediterranean Ocean appear to be affected. But for these, you know, terrestrial sources of RFI, unless they're located near a coastline, um, they probably wouldn't necessarily uh, screw up the ocean data at all. Okay, great. Uh, I think that's all the questions we have for today. Uh, but this has been a really uh, informative uh, presentation. I really appreciate the approachable way in which you, you presented all of this. 
Um, so thank you, Claire, for your time and preparation. And we remind our, our audience that a recording of this webinar will be posted to our website and social media channels within the next day or two. So thanks again. And we look forward to having you join us for a future IOM webinar. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity.